Hello all, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. We are very excited that you could make it to our very special St. Patrick's Day webinar, Ireland and India Partners in a Global Digital Economy. We come to you live from sunny Dublin. I want to say a special hello to all our friends that join us from India today. We would love to be meeting you all in person, but for obvious reasons that is not possible. I would also like to welcome our guest speakers. We are fortunate to have an exceptional lineup for you today, including Anthonisla, Deputy Prime Minister of Ireland and Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment, Leo Vradkar, Mr. Anantha Radhakrishnan, CEO and Managing Director of Emphasis, BPM, Mr. John Cormican, General Manager, at Vehicle Engineering, Jaguar Land Rover Ireland, and Mr. Deepak Chowdhury, Country Head, TCS Ireland. IDA's Director of India, Ms. Tanaz Bariwala, is also, also joins us uh, for this event. Before I hand over to the Thonishta for his opening remarks, I just want to make a couple of points. This event is about acknowledging and celebrating the special relationship between Ireland and India. India was the first country in Asia with which Ireland established former, formal diplomatic links in 1947. ID Ireland has had its offices in India since 2008. We have a team in Mumbai and Bangalore, but of course servicing a much wider geographical region. I have had the pleasure of visiting India most recently in 2019. I was also there in 2018, but of course last year it wasn't possible. But I very much look forward to visiting again soon. Indeed, every year we are seeing a growing number of Indian companies in Ireland and ever strengthening partnerships in research, collaborations and digital technologies. There are currently 29 Indian exporting companies in Ireland. The companies joining us today are excellent examples of Indian companies that have invested in Ireland. These Indian-owned companies have chosen Shannon, Donegal, Waterford and Wexford to invest in. Some of the reasons for those investments include the fact that we're English speaking, a member of the European Union, have a common law legal system, our strength and track record and return on investment that companies can achieve here, the availability of talent and a highly educated workforce. A little later, I'm going to speak to them about why they chose Ireland, their experiences of operating here, how COVID has impacted their businesses across the globe, and how they see the future of work post-pandemic. We are acutely aware that the last 12 months have been incredibly difficult, have been incredibly difficult for countries and companies and indeed for citizens and we are not out of the other side yet although the outlook is promising with a myriad of effective uh, vaccines and therapies being produced globally. Ireland as I'm sure the Thornishta will confirm remains open for business insofar as is possible and albeit virtually. Our commitment to supporting FDI has not waned and from the economic and enterprise data that we have from 2020, it is clear that investor commitment hasn't waned either as Ireland continues to attract investments even during this very difficult period. And that has had a positive impact on our economic performance. So today we are going to focus on the positives, the outlook for the global digital economy and the opportunities that come hand in hand with a strong India Ireland relationship. Our team is monitoring uh, the email address directly at india at ida.ie. The hashtag for social media is why Ireland. Our first speaker this afternoon has some very direct ties with India. Leo Vradkar, as I mentioned, is Deputy Prime Minister of Ireland and Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment. I know some of you uh, on the call may have met the Minister in the past, but for those of you that haven't, Dr Vradkar is a medical doctor, a member of the Irish Parliament, or Chakta in Gaelic. He represents the Dublin West constituency as a member of Fine Gael. He is a government minister since 2007. So without any further ado, I would like to call on the Thánaiste to address us. Thánaiste. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Martin. And it's a real pleasure for me to be with you today uh, to celebrate the great partnership between India and Ireland. Uh, as Thánaiste, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment, uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to meet with Indian business leaders representing some of the leading Indian companies here in Ireland. Uh, of course, we're also here to celebrate our national day, uh, St. Patrick's Day. So I'd like to wish you all a traditional Irish Caid Mila Fáilte. That's 100,000 welcomes in our native language, the Irish language. And Caid Mila Fáilte 
isn't just a marketing slogan. It's more than that. It's an ancient Irish greeting, a promise of a warm and long-lasting welcome to visitors and friends and newcomers. And I've always been fascinated by the fact that our ancient Celtic language, which is an Indo-European language, uh, bears some real interesting similarities to Hindi and Sanskrit. Uh, and those who know both languages will be able to count from one to four uh, in Hindi, which is eight uh, dotin char. In Gaelic, it's hein do tri car. And in many ways shows how some of those very old words, or old Indo-European words, uh, come through Sanskrit uh, and across the continents uh, to enrich both countries. And I believe that if words are to have meaning, then we should try to live our lives by them. And Ireland has always been a nation of migrants for centuries, starting with pre-Celtic tribes from Spain, Celts from Central Europe, Roman citizens from Britain, like our own patron saint, St. Patrick, who of course was almost certainly from England, not from Ireland, uh, Vikings and Norman French. And of course, uh, an Indian doctor uh, who married an Irish nurse, my parents, while they were both living and working together in England. And every time people come to Ireland, they bring new knowledge, new culture, and new wealth to our country, enriching us, often becoming more Irish than the Irish themselves. This year has been a very long year, but I have to say one of my highlights around this time last year was when I was given the opportunity to send a TV message to everyone in my father's home place of Varad, Malwan and Maharashtra, and everyone in India to say that we can get through this pandemic together and we can reopen our economies and restart our lives, and indeed we will. One year on, it's hard to believe that we're still fighting this virus, but the message remains the same. Yes, it has been very difficult, but as we begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel, the message of getting through and getting through this together has never been more important. I believe the relationship between our two countries is a story of partnership cooperation and friendship. It's grown and developed through the decades of mutually beneficial engagement in business, education, science, culture, tourism and sport. And on a personal note, I'm glad to see that Ireland's relative success in cricket in recent years. I'm one of, I'm one of the members of the cabinet who knows a little bit about cricket, in part as somebody who played it as a child, um, but more because I have an Indian father and I grew up in a house with someone for whom cricket was almost a religion. And this month, it's exactly 10 years since Ireland famously beat England in the World Cup in Bengaluru. And I know that that particular event and the participation of Irish players in the IPL probably did more to raise India's profile in Ireland uh, than any speech by a politician or any marketing campaign, dare I say it, even by the IDA. And Ireland really greatly values those strong bonds of friendship with India that go back many years. This year will reach two milestones in our bilateral relationships. First, we join India in celebrating the 70th anniversary of your embassy in Dublin. And the leaders of newly independent India valued their relationship with nations like Ireland. And Ireland reciprocated, as Martin said, by establishing our first embassy in Asia in New Delhi. This year, we'll also see the opening of Ireland House in Mumbai, if pandemic restrictions permit. And Ireland House will be the permanent home of Ireland's representation in India's commercial capital. It'll house our new Consulate General alongside IDA Ireland, Enterprise Ireland and Tourism Ireland. And this new investment in Mumbai demonstrates our commitment to continuing and further deepening our bonds with India as part of our Asia Pacific strategy. The Team Ireland approach, uh, working out of Mumbai and Bandra, not too far from my uncle's house, will enable a very strong and more effective collaboration across all government agencies and help ensure a consistent government level response to investors in Ireland. Ireland and India are also working together in a wider context in support of the multilateral system, which both our countries value highly. At the beginning of this year, Ireland and India both took up seats as elected members of the UN Security Council for the 2021-2022 term. Our countries are working closely together on the Security Council's agenda and are in regular communication to our government's embassies and permanent reps in the UN. We're literally sitting shoulder to shoulder at the Security Council table and Ireland's presidency of the Council in September will follow India's presidency in August. 
Another area where Ireland and India enjoy very close links, as you know, is education. Our countries share a belief in the transformative power of education and have deep connections in this sphere. Even before Ireland and India were independent states, there were close ties between us in education and literature. Irish religious orders set up Catholic schools in India, many of which still operate today. And whereas in the past, Irish educators went to India to provide an education, today around 5,000 students from India come to Ireland each year to continue their education. By Indian standards, 5,000 is a tiny number, but it's a pretty big number for us. And they, alongside IT workers, healthcare workers from states like Kerala, are wonderful ambassadors for 21st century India in Ireland and Europe. In the main, Indian students come to study ICT, biotechnology, cloud computing, and business, among other subjects. And these students, we hope, will create a lifelong connection between the two countries. And I have to say, I'd love to see more Irish students traveling to India to study in universities there too. At nearly 21,000 people, Indians are the largest Asian community in Ireland. We've had a Gurudwara for decades, and we have our first dedicated temple now. And of course, one of the key drivers of the Ireland-India story is that economic relationship. Geographic distance is no longer a significant barrier to building substantial trade relations between countries that are separated by oceans and continents. And the trade and investment business links between Ireland and India continue to flourish. India's size, the vibrancy of its industrial, commercial, and innovation sectors, and its emergence as a global industry leader make it an attractive option for Irish companies seeking new markets. Ireland's trade with India was almost 5 billion euros in 2019, and there's been a dramatic increase in the number of Irish companies doing business in India in recent years. More than 180 Irish companies now have a physical presence there, and are building, building solid partnerships with local business interests. And I know Indian companies also recognize the benefits of partnership with Ireland. And there's a strong footprint of Indian firms which have chosen to locate their operations here. Uh, companies such as Infosys, BPS, JLR Tata, and TCS, who are here with us today, and others too, like HCL Technologies, Wipro, and Tech Mahindra, and many more. And I want to ensure that Ireland remains an attractive location for Indian investors. As you know, Ireland is one of the most outward-looking and internationally engaged countries in the world. We're founding members of the European Single Market and Eurozone, and both government and our citizens remain overwhelmingly supportive of EU membership. From Ireland, Indian companies gain access to over 440 million EU consumers and a European labour force of 213 million people and uniquely to you full access to the UK labour market. And Ireland provides a base from which to passport financial services into the wider EU market. And our tax regime is one of the most consistent, open, transparent and competitive systems in the world. Our corporate tax rate of 12.5% for all companies in Ireland remains in place. And that's been our rate for more than 20 years now. And there's cross-party political support for it continuing. Our common law legal system is similar to the UK, and we have close geographical and cultural links with the UK as well. We have a young population, a quality education system, and this ensures plentiful supply of highly qualified people with excellent technical, language, and customer advice capabilities. And it's for these reasons, and many more, that Indian companies are choosing to base their operations here in a variety of sectors, including tech and digital, life sciences, financial services, engineering, digital media, games, and social media. The rapid emergence of the ICTC sector has placed India on, on the global stage for over 20 years. And Ireland has become a global tech hub and has earned the reputation of being at the heart of ICT in Europe, as well as a leading location for companies in the software sector. We're therefore natural partners in this area. Innovation and technology are catalysts in today's Irish economy, and they're right at the top of the national agenda. Our investment in science and technology is creating a vibrant and well-supported research community, giving a substantial resource for technology solutions and the basis for a stream of technology-based startups. We're also increasingly positioned as a knowledge-based economy with an innovation business climate. 
and our Indian technology leaders, such as TCS and Infosys and Wipro, are part of this story, driving the digital transformation journey in Ireland through their work with companies here. So it's an exciting time, and there's so much to be gained from the partnership between our two countries. And I think we're very much looking forward to developing these opportunities and achieving future growth in the years ahead. I know we're moving on to a panel discussion shortly, and I'd be very interested to hear your views and your vision for the future, and particularly how Ireland can continue to partner with you in the years ahead as you develop your operations here. So thank you very much, and happy St. Patrick's Day again. Tanishta, thank you very much for those uh, remarks. Um, we're now going to go to our very talented uh, Director of India, Tanaz Buharawala. Tanaz. Thank you, Martin. Hello, Antanisha. It is great to have you with us today. And a very warm welcome again to our esteemed panelists. I would like to thank you for your participation. Your presence today is an appreciation of the deep and successful business relationship that we share. And of course, I look forward to the discussion. As someone working on the ground in India for over a decade, fostering relationships between India and Ireland on a daily basis, I have seen the growing interest amongst Indian companies about Ireland. Now, IDA has made a long-term commitment to India, and there are a number of Indian companies that have established a presence in Ireland. We see this number increase every year, and with many existing investors also expanding their footprint, all our panelists today are, uh, represent such companies. Now, many of these companies are bringing in high-value investments into Ireland, and IDA values this partnership. As our relationship continues to grow, with all the companies in India, it is now even more important than ever before that we work closely with the existing Indian companies in Ireland, and then we innovate together with them at the forefront. We all know that the global economy is becoming increasingly tech-oriented, and irrespective of the sector, digital is the way forward. It isn't surprising to see companies explore setting up centers of excellence, digital pods, R&D teams in Ireland. Now, this has given the expertise the relevant skill set and the knowledge base that is available in Ireland. As my team and I continue to work in the market, we also see the growing interest in more companies looking towards having a presence in Ireland to do business in the EU. And since Brexit, this is, this is so they continue to do so seamlessly. As we deal with the unexpected changes and the challenges created by COVID-19 pandemic, as well as all the many geopolitical changes that have taken place globally in the last 24 months, the necessity of doing business and having a presence in a stable jurisdiction stands out, as also does the fact that resilience is important. Now, Ireland stands out with its pro-business government, and uh, Aunt Anishna has touched on it, all the established supply chain clusters, their commitment um, by Ireland to supporting new age tech businesses and also the support and also the fact that Ireland supported companies during this extraordinary pandemic situation. Proof is employment growth of 3.6% in IDA supported companies was achieved in 2020. This in itself is a testament to Ireland's stability. Now, IDA India team's local market initiatives have focused on widening our reach in the Indian market amongst companies of different sectors. We continue to work with companies across sectors, including life sciences, advanced engineering, future mobility, IT and IT services, as well as fast growth companies. My team and I continue to explore the vibrant tech sectors, the subsectors, and we deepen our base within companies in the FinTech, IoT, animation, gaming, future mobility, uh, AI, AR, VR, blockchain, and cybersecurity companies in India. Now, I've been fortunate to have an opportunity to partner with and witness the two great cultures, English, uh, Indian and Irish meat. I have traveled extensively across India and I've visited Ireland on multiple occasions. The similarities and cultural parallels of the two countries stand out through our common appreciation of fine arts, our sense of humor, the hardworking as well as welcoming nature of the general population, as well as love for family. These are just some examples. It is little wonder then that people of the two countries gel and work well together. Our countries have been longstanding partners through decades, and this partner partnership continues to grow through our shared values. 
I remain optimistic about the future of the Indian-Irish business relationship. And on this note, I'd like to hand back to you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Tanaz, for those remarks. Um, I would now like to introduce our panel in a little uh, more detail. So uh, our first panelist this afternoon is Mr. Anantha Radhakrishnan, CEO and Managing Director of Emphasis. Um, Radha, uh, nice to see you. Uh, I have had the pleasure of obviously visiting Emphasis, as I mentioned earlier, and thank you for your uh, hospitality. Uh, Radha is extraordinarily uh, accomplished in terms of um, his time as CEO of um, of emphasis and indeed was prior to that uh, COO uh, managing global operations. He has played multiple roles indeed in emphasis BPM spanning technology transformation, in, uh, enterprise capability and global centers management, working with clients in their transformation journey, enhancing business value delivered. And I know Rad also you're a strong uh, practitioner in heart and head and you formulated the, the four E's and uh, we very much maybe look forward to hearing a little a bit of those four E's coming in during the course of our uh, discussion. Uh, we have with us also this afternoon uh, Deepak Chowdhury. Uh, it's great to see you again, uh, Deepak. Um, and uh, Deepak is country manager for, um, for Tata, uh, for, for T TCS. And indeed, um, Deepak has been with Tata Consultancy Services uh, for the past 20 years and um, took over as um, country head in August uh, 2018. Um, Deepak, I, um, I, I know you, because you've had a very significant um, expansion in Ireland in recent times through uh, your partnership uh, with Primerica in uh, Donegal, and I want to touch on that in a, uh, in, in a few moments and hear more about what that has meant and why Ireland, obviously, uh, for uh, TCS. But before I, uh, we come back uh, to that, um, it, maybe uh, just introduce John Cormican, uh, a very good friend of IDA, I might say, uh, a general manager of vehicle engineering at uh, Jaguar Land Rover Ireland. Uh, John, you're very welcome uh, this afternoon. Uh, John um, has been key to developing and setting up JLR uh, uh, and its software engineering operation in Shannon since 2017 um, and uh, has been leading the US software engineering in Portland since 20. 18. Uh, the teams play an important role in realizing JLR's vision towards uh, electric and automated uh, driving vehicles through connected services, data, and software. Uh, John started his career as a software engineer in Peercom and uh, Tel Labs and also uh, spent 15 years at uh, Intel, where he was director, director of automotive business development. So you're all very welcome. Uh, we have lots to uh, discuss. Radha, I'm going to come back to you first uh, and ask you, what has the pandemic meant for your company? How has it impacted uh, globally? And what is the future post-pandemic in terms of the way we work? Yeah, thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you, Tanaz. And uh, of course, Honorable Prime and Deputy Prime Minister, sir, Tanaste. Thank you. Wonderful to have Deepak and John as well in this panel. Uh, great question, Martin. While the pandemic has uh, thrown up uh, challenges, it's also thrown up tremendous opportunity. An overnight shift to the virtual world and hybrid operating model with the bulk of our workforce, both in Ireland and across the globe, moving to a virtual work from home model. We have clearly seen COVID behave like the chief digital officer for a lot of our clients. It's accelerated digital transformation. It's brought out new investments, focus on conserving cash, cost optimization to make organizations a lot more agile and a live enterprise to respond to these challenges. It has meant new opportunities have come our way. Of course, by sector, this has been different, but at an overall Infosys group level, which is our consulting, technology, and business process management arm, we've given a guidance of 4 to 5% for this year in terms of growth. Specifically, BPM business, which I head, has shown good growth, we would end the year with a growth anywhere between 13 and 
that's phenomenal growth. Um, thank you, Radha, for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, maybe I'll go with the same question uh, to, to Deepak in terms of the impact on your business, uh, Deepak. But obviously, you've also expanded in Ireland during that period. So you might talk to us about um, uh, your expansion in Letterkenny. Thank you very much. Thank you, and a very warm welcome and hello to everyone here. And uh, yes, uh, you know, TCS has been in Ireland for long, since 2001, and uh, has been serving about 30 customers, both Irish companies and global companies. And last year, although we had a pandemic, it was a phenomenal uh, big step for TCS in Ireland. And I'm very pleased with the investment what TCS has done in Ireland in the last year, where we had about 1,500 highly skilled Primerica employees join into TCS family in Ireland. So we are very excited about this move and uh, we have welcomed them and we are very impressed with the deep technology and business skills which this has added to our business in Ireland. So you asked us uh, in terms of what next steps do you see? Yeah, well, we are looking at this uh, as setting up our first Irish global delivery center in, in Ireland here. And this will provide TCS customers with uh, multifunctional end-to-end -end digital services, operations, and drive innovations and competitiveness. Uh, and we have recently also seen some good uh, wins in the Irish market, which gives me a lot of confidence that we can do more in this market. So I've also seen that uh, you know the investments that we have made in Ireland through Letterkenny is a huge reflection on how we see Ireland, you know, the good set of talent that uh, Ireland is able to provide. We have access to a large conglomeration of industries and the companies in the region, the ecosystem that Ireland fosters, you know, right from academical institutes to various industry bodies, innovation culture, the startups, uh, the, the, uh, you know, Antonis also touched upon some of the key benefits of Ireland, which we can clearly see. The UK uh, common travel agreement, you know, the, the free movements, uh, the support uh, that's available. So in summary, this is a great strategic investment from TCS in Ireland, and uh, we are looking very optimistically uh, uh, to the future uh, here. We do see a strong uh, growth taking place across business for TCS. Uh, we see a strong demand from UK, Europe, and within Ireland as well. And we are hoping that with this Irish uh, uh, Development Centre, we are able to provide for those growth areas. Thank you very much, uh, Deepak, uh, for that. And it's, it's just great to hear about your plans in Ireland. Um, and we very much look forward to working with you on those plans. John, if I can turn to you, uh, we've seen obviously phenomenal growth um, in uh, JLR's activity in Ireland over the past number of years. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Sure. Thanks, Martin. So, yeah, we, we started off here, Martin, um, about nearly four years ago in May of 2017. We had a handful of engineers starting off, um, about 12 people, um, all happened to be uh, coming from, from Intel at the time, ex-Intel people. And now we have something like 250 people here in, in Shannon. So it's been fairly significant growth for us in, in a short space of time. We would have been probably more if it wasn't for the pandemic. We have to be careful and, and a little bit deliberate and strategic in our thinking in terms of hiring, especially over the last 12 months, because it's very challenging to bring new people into a business when they're completely remote working from home. We're still doing that and, and we take great care over that, but nonetheless, it's a challenge. Um, and the big thing for us, like everybody else, is having to adjust to the new way of working in the last 12 months. And, and thankfully for us, I'm very proud of the team here, you know, largely with software engineering is a capability that can be done largely from home. So um, we've been successful in delivering our programs and our projects over the last 12 months, but of course, we still want to bring people together when it's the right thing to do. Um, so yeah, we, we're thinking very carefully now about what the future is in terms of what do we need in terms of infrastructure, in terms of supports, in terms of defining our culture post COVID, because these are all big questions that we all have to answer. Um, instead of putting you know, millions of euros into glass and concrete and new buildings, We'll put the money into our into our into our people, into our teams, and perhaps use the, the investment for things like um, a larger infrastructure for our for our vehicles, or new testing grounds to do specific use testing use case testing for autonomous driving. So it's really made us radically rethink our strategy in terms of investment, in terms of people, in terms of culture. 
But nonetheless, I, I also think it's a huge opportunity because we've learned quite a lot. We've learned a huge amount over the last 12 months. COVID has forced us into a certain way of working. And now we must take the best of what we've learned in the last 12 months, take that forward into a new way of working um, in terms of the future. So I think, yes, it's been a challenge, but, but it's also forced us to learn a lot and, and radically rethink our strategy. Thank you, John, for that. I think definitely lots to think about. And just on that, Radha, um, when you think about the future of work, will we need offices in that future? Or to what extent will we need offices? Well, Martin, uh, the definition of work, the definition of the workplace, and the definition of the worker, all of this is undergoing significant change. That's important for us to realize it. Just to give you a flavor, uh, in Ireland, uh, we have eight centers already across Dublin and Waterford and Wexford and Plon, uh, Clonmel and Agmon. So we have approximately 1,800 employees. And we have now moved these employees. More than 90% are working from home. Clearly, the opportunity is to attract more talent, which are gig worker-based, specialist, high-skilled resources who are willing to spend some time carrying out specialized work in a business process on cloud model, enabled through cloud technologies. Clearly, the work itself is going to become a combination of digital plus human coming together. I call it uh, digital plus humanware coming together. And our ability to automate the transaction, eliminate a lot of the straight through process uh, uh, work, and clearly handled exceptions by using analytics and applied AI to solve along with domain expertise and design thinking with a lot of empathy is what is going to be the definition of work for the future for that very thoughtful response. Tanish, I might come back to you for a moment. It's, uh, it's just literally little, a little over a year since uh, you, as, as then Prime Minister, stood up in Washington, I think it was in Washington at the same time, and you announced we were going into lockdown. Uh, we have learned so much since then in terms of you know, what we can actually do uh, remotely and virtually. And uh, as the government thinks about, I suppose, the medium term and post the um, pandemic, what do you think it will mean in terms of the types of investments that we will need to make? Will it be different to the investments we, tried to, we, we, we had to make previously in terms of infrastructure and so on? Yeah, but I'll answer that, answer that in one minute, but just before I do, just, just a reflection I had listening to, to Deepak and Radha and, and, and John and Tanaz. And one thing that really hit me by your contributions there um, was the extent to which uh, Indian firms have invested in, in all parts of Ireland. Because uh, a big challenge that I have um, as a member of government is to th get people to think of investing in places other than Dublin. Um, and emphasis is big in the southeast. Um, um, TCS has done what, what, what you've done in Letterkenny in the northwest, um, taking on Primerica there, and uh, Jaguar Land Rover is very much in Shannon. So, you know, we often feel that investments outside Dublin are worth almost twice as much as the ones inside Dublin, at least politically, if not financially <laughs> or economically. And um, we're, we're very grateful for, 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 the, for the fact that, that Indian firms have done exactly that, and, um, and we want to see... Um, I uh, want to see more of that into the future. Um, but to answer your question, I think what the pandemic has probably done is accelerated changes that were happening anyway uh, in our society and our economy. And we always talk about the twin, the twin transition, um, which is digital and green. Um, and digital is obviously being uh, sped up, and we were investing anyway in high-speed broadband. Uh, within five to seven years, every home farm business in Ireland will have fibre. We wanted a few countries to do that. That now looks like a really good investment now, even though it was quite controversial uh, a year or two ago when we decided to do it. Um, uh, and then also, obviously, we'll be accelerating um, our, our climate action and things like remote working, um, things like making sure data centres are powered by renewable energy as opposed to fossil fuels. All of those things now, I think, become more important. Um, and become uh, accelerated. But one thing government will definitely do is to invest in, in capital. Uh, after the last financial crisis 10, 12 years ago, we had to pair back investment infrastructure very, very steeply. We're in a different place now um, because of the policy of the ECB, because um, our 
budget was in surplus before the pandemic. Uh, we're not going to cut back on, on public infrastructure spending. We're actually going to um, increase it over the next couple of years. Thank you very much, Tanishta. Um, I might just come back to uh, something that you were discussing, John, before uh, um, uh, when you, in your last intervention. Which technologies are going to be the most important going forward for chatted, chatted JLR? Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's a few, I guess, Martin, and, and I think we've touched on it already. I mean, for, for me, it's about data. Um, it's really about understanding the data that our vehicles generate and how to make the most of that intelligence, if you like. And there's several technologies that can be used to make the most of that. So I know, for example, Deepak and the team are have a big software team, as do we, in terms of managing um, that, that data and creating connected services around that. So things like machine learning, artificial intelligence, cloud services, cybersecurity, functional safety is important for us because we've got to keep our, our passengers safe in our vehicle, as well as you know the, 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 the real world scenario of driving vehicles autonomously, for example. So there's lots of underlying technologies that feed into, into what we're doing. It's not just about the car. And that's why Ireland, to me, is very important because we have a very vibrant ecosystem here of software, of technology, together with the, the folks in India. And, and that's a huge strength for us because, as I say, the, the future vehicle is not just about you know brakes and calipers and body control and chassis and um, the traditional mechanical world, if you like. It's about, it's about software, it's about electronics, it's about managing data. It's about managing um, you know, services and, and, and software is the glue that, that kind of binds all that together. And that's why essentially Jaguar Land Rover is, is here in Ireland because we can, we can access that vibrant ecosystems and we can do things very, very quickly to develop new services. So, um, so that's, that's probably a very short answer to, to what could be a very, a very long question um, if, if I had more time. But I, I certainly think that the data and machine learning, artificial intelligence will be top of my list right now. Thanks, John. I think that's a very concise answer to what is a very, uh, I have to acknowledge, very probably challenging question at the best of times. And uh, it's something obviously we try to give a lot of thought to here at IDA. Deepak, I might ask you to comment on, on the similar question, but also, Deepak, you might uh, talk to us about the importance of talent and the availability of talent uh, to the work of uh, TCS. No, absolutely. And what we have seen is uh, COVID has had a huge impact and it's changed the way we look at work. You know, it's, we have seen that uh, people can work remotely and it's, it's brought a paradigm shift in the very nature of work. And what companies are doing is we are fully trying to tap into the talent cloud. How can we effectively leverage a number of new age technologies and offer equal opportunities across geography, gender, or, you know, also this helps us to even go across, like within Ireland, if you could see within Northwest, the investments that TCS has done there. We see a great opportunity for this talent to provide services anywhere within Ireland, or it could be, you know, even at a, at a global scale. This center that we have invested in was uh, already providing services to US customers, but we are now opening this center to provide services within Ireland, uh, UK, Europe, and so on. So I see uh, this also helps from a people point of view. It uh, also uh, gives a good quality of life for people and has uh, Tony also pointed out, uh, you know, people are able to enjoy a good quality of life while being outside of Dublin, you know, a much, uh, you know, better uh, living, you can live in a large good house, enjoy besides the, you know, besides the sea. And uh, there are some real good, uh, beautiful things which Ireland has got to offer, even outside of Dublin. Thank you very much, uh, Deepak, for those comments. Um, maybe, uh, Switching gears ever so slightly, uh, Rada, I want to come to you and actually I, I, I'll go to the Thornish then on a somewhat similar question. On the issue of leadership during this period, it's been, as I said at the outset, a very challenging time for companies, for uh, the teams in those companies, and indeed for, for citizens across the globe. What are the important attributes of good leadership, Rada, at this point in time, and what have they been over the past year? Thanks so much, Martin. A great question. Uh, indeed, the global pandemic has thrown us so much challenges uh, across the globe, balancing out the employee needs in terms of safety, health, and at the same time, ensuring business operations continue without a break for clients and delivering great performance for our shareholders. I think uh, leadership has been truly tested. I call this 
I, I, I essentially can talk of five key tenets looking at my own experience of uh, having led through this crisis and seeing other leaders within Infosys and country leaders across the world leading. I call this the authentic leadership tenets. Uh, the first one is to clearly be very mindful, mindful of the fact of your own mindset and what you bring and the situation around you in terms of empathy and understanding the situation across the globe in different locations, different countries. It's about serving with empathy. That's the second tenet. The first tenet is really being mindful. The second tenet is serving with empathy. The third tenet is acknowledging that no single person has all the answers. The fact that acknowledging your own vulnerability, the fact that you could be an expert and bring knowledge in a domain or an area, but clearly you surround yourself with people who have the knowledge of the local law, the regulation, uh, data privacy, cybersecurity, the whole bunch of things, a complete range of things on which you clearly need to depend on others. And that you can do only if you have the humility to acknowledge your own vulnerability. The fourth area is what I call as crucibles of experience. Clearly look at your own experience and build resilience and learnings from those experiences so that you can bring that to bear in the way you demonstrate behavior as a leader. And last but not the least, I call this the art of giving. This is about giving time. It's about sharing knowledge. It's about having a larger purpose in terms of contributing towards uh, the societies you live in, contributing to the people who might be less fortunate than you in many ways, and putting that larger sense of purpose for what you are leading your organization for. So I think all of these five tenets of authentic leadership, I believe has helped us come out of this crisis as better human beings, better professionals, and better leaders. Thank you, Radha, for such a, a thoughtful answer. Uh, Tónishta, uh, you obviously have led Ireland during the, the first part of this crisis uh, as Prime Minister and, and, and are now leading as, as Deputy Prime Minister. Are the uh, tenets that uh, Radha has set out, are they the same for the leader of a country as a, a company? Um, you know, I, I, I think they are. Um, I, I think I should write those down. That was a really good answer. <laughs> I, I might use it next time I ask that question, question again. Um, but I think the first one that you mentioned, um, you know, empathy is an obvious one in the sense that, you know, you, ca you can't lead a country unless you care for the people in it and are concerned about the people who are affected, whether it's people whose lives are at risk or people whose jobs and businesses are at risk. Um, and then trying to balance all those issues is really difficult. But I think the um, first one that you said of being self-aware, I think, is really important too. And uh, one thing I've had to find myself having to correct for a bit is, is optimism bias. Um, um, because ultimately, I'm an optimist, and I think that things will probably get better. And unfortunately, so many times in this pandemic, when we thought we were getting out of it, um, things happened, and we ended up um, going backwards. Um, but optimism is a good thing, I think. And uh, you know, a big part of my job now, um, not being in the Prime Minister's office, but being in, in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment, is to make sure that the nearly half a million people who are out of work at the moment, uh, whose jobs have been suspended, can, can get back to work over the next year or so, and that those 20,000 businesses that are closed can recover. Yeah, I'm going to feed into that optimism bias now in a moment because I'm going to ask you about the, the optimistic future in a moment. But I'm going to ask our panellists just maybe uh, that question first. And uh, if I can ask you, uh, because we're, we're coming near the end, just what are your hopes and wishes for Ireland and India over the next um, uh, short period? So, Radha, I'll start with you. Well, uh, I reflect the optimism bias uh, as a leader, especially in a crisis situation like this, having a growth mindset or an optimism bias is very, very crucial to infuse uh, aspirations, to, uh, to work towards something better, uh, both for uh, India and Ireland, as well as in terms of creation of high-skilled uh, employment opportunities here in Ireland and delivering greater value to our global clients, whether it's high-tech customers or ICT customers, 
bringing the best of digital technology and the best of human elements of domain expertise, uh, empathy, uh, design thinking, and exception handling skills is something which I uh, uh, would like to work on and lead. Thank you, Radha. Deepak, your wishes for Ireland and India. Well, India and Ireland have uh, had a long history where each of them have contributed to different areas. As Antonis also pointed out, uh, you know, right from education, research areas, and I see a uh, number of industries can come together. Technology as well as is, is bonding both the uh, countries uh, in a great extent. Innovation, the kind of work what is taking place as an ecosystem environment. I'm really pleased with that, and I, I'm hoping that all of these things continue. I'm also hoping that the talent skills that we're looking uh, both in India as well as uh, uh, Ireland are able to come together uh, quite well to create you know, larger value for, 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 for uh, the customers overall. Thank you, Deepak. John. Yeah, I, I think we have to all be optimistic, right? It's, it's, it's a fundamental um, characteristic to, to, to be optimistic. Otherwise, where would we be? I think the tonish to said two very important things. He talked about digital transformation and the green economy. And for me, the reason I'm op uh, optimistic is because there's huge, huge opportunity in those two areas in, in, the ter in terms of digital transformation and in the area of connected and autonomous vehicles and electrified vehicles is exactly where we're going as a company. That's massive. Um, so the skills and the capabilities and the know-how the, the know we have in this country, in Ireland, as well as working with our colleagues in India, I think is massive for us. So if we can really double down and figure out, you know, how we can make the most of this digital transformation and this green economy, which is coming, and use the skills and the capabilities and the people that we have, I think we're in a fantastic position. Thanks, John. I'm going to go to, to Naz now, but it's actually a, a requirement to come to work to IDA, in IDA that you are optimistic. And I know Tanaz is going to wish for investments and jobs. And please help her out in that. Uh, uh, Tanaz. Yes, uh, yes, Martin, thank you. But I am just a hopeless optimist. And uh, I've touched on this before. We are seeing a large number of trading companies setting up in Ireland year on year. And these companies continue to grow their footprint as well. We are also seeing equally Irish companies working in India, and the number continues to grow. And what is happening is a lot of these companies are from between uh, the companies that are working with Irish companies and are in Ireland. And I think that partnership is what's going to help us uh, uh, move to the next level, along with, all, along with all the research collaborations that are taking place in India. We've just not talk, spoken enough about them, but there are research collaborations in India. Thank you very much, Tanaz. And Tanish, I'm going to leave the last word to you. And you can be as optimistic as you, as, as you need to be. Um, I don't know much to add to what's been said, but I, I think this was a really interesting event and really interesting to hear from, um, from business leaders. Um, and I'm uh, firmly optimistic about what can be done between Ireland and India. Uh, in the years ahead, you know, particularly um, Ireland's traditional role has been uh, a bridge between uh, the EU and the US, and um, that's even more so now that the UK has left the EU. And I'd like to imagine that um, Ireland could potentially be a bridge between uh, Europe and India in years to come, particularly between the EU and India. Um, and really hope once this pandemic is over that I can get out there and um, and uh, get on the ground and meet some of the companies and. Um, and uh, look forward to working with you as well. Thank you very much, Tanish. All uh, that remains is for me to um, thank you all for uh, participating in uh, this webinar today, particularly thank the Tanish for uh, his participation. Uh, but I also want to thank Radha and Deepak and John, and of course, Tanaz. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day.